look, uh, what's happening in a in a destabilized state like Myanmar uh, is starting to happen, as shocking as it may seem, in Western countries. And that is that uh, Chinese transnational gangs with connections to casinos, with connections to fentanyl trafficking, Belt and Road projects are uh, supported. They're directed. They are allowed to do their activity if they will in turn uh, give something back of a uh, political benefit uh, to the client, which is the Chinese state. So the Canada model or the snow wash, yeah. uh, whether you call it cold war or hybrid war, it's becoming clear. It's a very effective strategy to destabilize and and in some ways, in some ways, capture influential people in, in Western countries. So I'm saying that it's not unrealistic to say from tens of billions up to you know, a hundred or so or more billion has been laundered in Vancouver real estate. Membership in the five eyes isn't a right. <laughs> it's a privilege. And Canada is going in the wrong direction. It can't be denied on that one. Really nice to speak with you. You are a longtime Canadian investigative journalist, uh, specifically focusing on uh, corruption, Chinese Communist Party involvement in Canada and overseas, uh, money laundering, etc. And we'll get into those topics. And uh, obviously, the recent successful author of Willful Blindness. Congratulations on your book. Thanks for that. And thanks for having me. Could you just explain to those that, that may not know you your, your brief background and, and how you got into, one, investigative journalism and how you ended up into your specialty, and then obviously publication of, of your book, and where you're at now. Yeah, uh, it's really been a, a six, I've been in journalism for 16 years. Uh, I went to a school at University of Toronto and did the uh, the law school undergraduate with my history, philosophy, and <laughs> logic, English, very broad education, and then decided I did not want to go to law school, and eventually got into journalism. But I found right from the start, I was attracted to court cases, sitting in court, seeing the testing of evidence and, uh, you know, recognizing that I was uh, drawn to the most serious uh, stories and uh, corruption, high level corruption, money laundering, drug trafficking. Uh, those came as a natural interest because I was a young reporter in, in Vancouver. And uh, as I've, you know, explained to others, uh, I was shocked and and disturbed by the open air drug market in the downtown east side and and how thousands of Canadians were dying in in ways that I, I it didn't appear to be uh, the first world you know law and order country that I had grown up to believe in and so uh, just to cut it short I you know I just uh, as a reporter uh, I, I followed uh, I started to follow the money uh, and year by year it became clear that real estate and narco proceeds were connected in Vancouver. How they were connected, uh, it, it wasn't always clear, but Vancouver was appearing to be a, a city much like Miami that was much influenced by South American corruption and, and cocaine proceeds. But the story in Vancouver was different. Eventually, uh, I figured out this casino money laundering story and how uh, what became known as the Vancouver model, that is how triad drug banks based out of Hong Kong, Macau, and China move uh, proceeds around the world of, of, of drug trafficking, uh, of heroin, of fentanyl, but they also use ultra-wealthy uh, Chinese business persons to move that money in a symbiotic trade. So that's really how I got up to um, uh, willful blindness. Uh, in a nutshell, it's sort of 10 years of research, realizations, epiphanies, and then it it came into this, you know, uh, almost 500 page book of evidence and a personal story of how I figured this out and how I got close to sources, whistleblowers that were just extremely disturbed with what's going on in Canada. And to finish up, what I've added to the discussion and what I know is of interest to uh, uh, agencies in our in our ally countries around the world, and uh, of course Australia, uh, the United States, and uh, United Kingdom, is that how connected the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese intelligence, uh, China's United Front Work Department, is to these Chinese transnational gangs, 
and how something called the United Front uses uh, gang operatives, uh, tycoons, community leaders, and and really uh, co-ops them and uses them towards the Chinese Communist Party's ends. And uh, this is something that some people would call essentially, uh, whether you call it Cold War or hybrid war, it's becoming clear it's a very effective strategy to destabilize and and in some ways in some ways capture influential people in in Western countries. And I've seen your descriptions elsewhere on on hybrid war, asymmetric war, uh, unconventional war, and uh, how the, the Chinese Communist Party puts this into effect um, abroad, but now most particularly in Canada. Can you describe what this Vancouver now was becoming known as the, the Canada model of of the snow washing of of using Canada and uh, infiltrating our um, national infrastructure, for lack of a better term, both municipally, provincially, and federally. And and how does that play into uh, their strategy? Yeah, it's a complex strategy. And I like to say that I don't think that the people in Beijing always have the strategy completely figured out and the actors completely figured out. There are complex players that are playing all sides. Uh, Self-interest, business interest, greed, and fear are all part of the mix. But what is clear is that uh, Beijing has a very long game and the ability to leverage and uh, uh, co-opt um, that not not exactly the ability, but the 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 desire to co-opt anyone that uh, immigrates from China and, and attempt to use them and control them. So how it works. Uh, look, uh, what's happening in a in a destabilized state like Myanmar? Uh, is starting to happen, as shocking as it may seem, in Western countries. And that is that uh, Chinese transnational gangs with connections to casinos, with connections to fentanyl trafficking, Belt and Road projects are uh, supported. They're directed. They are allowed to do their activity if they will in turn uh, give something back of a political benefit uh, to the client, which is the Chinese state. So the Canada model or the snow washing, just to focus in on the financial side, uh, it's it's best to just walk through a, an easy transaction. Let's say uh, a wealthy uh, official with connections to the United Front in China, uh, you know, maybe uh, wants to, like many Chinese officials, invest abroad. They have a million dollars. They make a connection with a uh, a loan sharking gain in Vancouver who has met them in a Macau casino. Of course, it's not legal to gamble in China, but it is in Macau. So the Chinese official is invited to go to Vancouver. Uh, he is told, once you land uh, in the Richmond airport, hit me up with a WeChat text, go to the casino. Most specifically, it was the River Rock Casino where there was a scheme where these ultra wealthy high limit gamblers almost uh, exclusively from the People's Republic of China traveled to that casino. They texted the gangster. He met them in a parking lot, let's say a Costco, very near the casino. He gets a million dollars in cash, $20 bills, sometimes hundreds, walks into the casino easily against all money laundering indicators and, uh, you know, really the law, gets chips, gambles, and, uh, he uh, maybe gets lucky uh, that night or that week. He converts his million to 1.5 million. And, and so, of course, he's got a down payment if he wants on a Vancouver property. Uh, but let's focus on what, what is uh, accomplished by the loan shark is you've lent out that million in drug cash and the gambler pays back in China with a bank deposit. So uh, you've also, you're also getting some interest on that. So the the ultra the the wealthy official has gotten a million dollars out of China. The gangster has washed his Vancouver drug cash. He's got taken payment back in China. Of course, that will go into a from the drug traffickers bank account to a factory in southern China to produce some more fentanyl precursors and send those precursors over to Vancouver to be pressed up in a lab. Fentanyl produced, uh, the drugs sold around the world, cash collected. And the process repeats. So that's the financial side. And uh, I can walk you through it again because I, it can get complex. But once we get into the real estate activity, 
and you know the symbiotic relationship of the ch- transnational gangster the who is an underground banker and this chinese official when they're in vancouver and they can are are part of a united front network not only are they laundering money but uh activities such as donations to political parties cash for access events funding of these astroturf uh united front community groups can occur with these actors so in a nutshell i think you know without going on for 30 minutes that brings together the financial side and the political uh threat financing and the ccp activity side it's it's exceptionally complex and it's it's interesting there's almost three dynamics here there's there's one there's there's chinese one that, that a lot of people want to offshore to do their own problems with the Chinese Communist Party. So, and that's a closed capital account. So to convert that, uh, those proceeds on that end, it's all done through intermediaries as, as you describe, and then underground banking, which is simply massive. So then they extract it in Canada. Tell me where I'm going wrong. They extract it, extract it in Canada. So whether the, the, the proceeds are, are winnings of, of, of 10% or, or, or less, it's still a method to then inject it and, and wash that in Canada into a proceed and then the real estate. Fascinating and for anyone that, that needs a more detailed description, I'd, I'd say read the book, uh, yeah. go back to the book. Read the it's, book a few times. Yeah, definitely. So now focusing on where, where Canada fits in, how is that money then washed into the, the real estate market? What numbers are we talking about? I mean, the River Rock Casino, for anyone that were to go there, um, it doesn't look like the most exclusive place and yet, hundreds of millions are being washed through there with, and we're seeing that with the Cullen Commission. Um, can you speak to what exactly went on in Richmond in these casinos and how that then facilitated uh, the, the washing through the real estate market and what the Cullen Commission uh, determined? Sure. So I'll break it down into three or four points. Um, and I've got in my mind some uh, named and pictured suspects to help. Uh, so Look, I estimated before the evidence uh, was absolutely clear, which it now is, anyone can go into the Cullen Commission website and and look in 70,000 pages of evidence. Uh, I estimated about 2 billion had been laundered through BC government casinos in this Vancouver model. And I learned that, you know, not only was I right on, uh, I was probably a little bit low in my estimate. you know, because what we can see on paper in these trades uh, is not exponentially higher, but uh, much higher from the evidence in, you know, side bets. You'll have a, a gangster standing to the left of some guy that's running a baccarat table and placing side bets and, you know, people passing chips back and forth. No one can keep track of how much money passed through those casinos. But what we can say is that uh, to my estimate of $2 billion, what what the Cullen Commission focused on was this e-pirate investigation. So uh, 36 uh, PRC whale gamblers uh, were uh, quickly uh, identified when the government learned that uh, the RCMP was targeting casinos and had discovered the core node of this Vancouver model. The big circle boys or, uh, you know, triad underground banking group that was funding these PRC gamblers, uh, they identified 36. Those were immediately uh, put on so-called cash conditions for the River Rock Casino, meaning they couldn't gamble anymore unless they came in with a bank slip. But uh, analytics determined that, uh, and we can now see this on the Cullen Commission website if you know how to parse it together, these 36 whale gamblers in from 2010 to 2015 responsible for 414 million in suspicious transactions. These are money laundering transactions. And so uh, reported to FinTrack. So that's 36 gamblers. There were uh, close to 1,000 high-risk similar gamblers identified uh, over the years, the recent years, in BC Lottery Corporation casinos. This has been going on since the late 1990s with elite transnational uh, heroin traffickers being the number one uh, patrons and the number one loan sharks together inside the Richmond Casino, right? So this has been going on for decades. I've pointed to 36 uh, PRC whales investigated by the RCMP, 
responsible for about 500 million, let's say, in five years. So multiply that by hundreds. That gives you an idea of the scale. But as people tell me, the, the, as police sources tell me, the casino activity is the tip of the iceberg of the related real estate activity. And uh, I say it's, it's hard to exactly quantify how much money has been laundered in Vancouver and Toronto by the triad networks, who are, by the way, facilitating, uh, we now know, elite Middle Eastern crime, elite Mexican, the top Mexican and Colombian cartels have made their home in Vancouver, are using it, and the Chinese triad underground banks are laundering all their money and moving it around the world. But to, to not get too complicated here, Look, I estimate from tens of billions and above has been laundered in this Vancouver model in Vancouver real estate. And that goes from people buying single family homes, uh, knocking a teardown that, you know, a tear, what we call a teardown home down, uh, a Vancouver special that they bought for, let's say, one million, uh, then laundering drug money into it through the very same casino loan sharks and building it up into a mansion and selling it for let's say 5 million. That's, that's one indicator of the money laundering going on. But there are real estate developers that are banned from BC Lottery casinos for, the, for Vancouver model transactions. There are Hong Kong real estate developers directly connected to triad activity that have been the, some of the biggest developers in Vancouver since uh, the late 80s. So I'm saying that it's not unrealistic to say from tens of billions up to, you know, a hundred or so or more billion has been laundered in Vancouver real estate. Your reporting is, is typically focused on Vancouver. That, that's been the jump off spot, but you've also identified this happening uh, in Toronto and you've scratched the surface as well in other provinces. This is happening coast to coast. And that's why you've, you've, you've alluded to the fact that this isn't just the Vancouver model. This is the Canada model. Um, but with that, and no offense, you're just a reporter, quote unquote, just a reporter. And it seems like you've you've been explaining this and, and parsing this uh, for decades now. Yeah. Be- um, before I forget, can I just jump in on your point? And but look, yeah, coast to coast. So Prince Edward Island, very same uh, PRC, you know, whale networks are facilitated in Prince Edward Island. You know, you can see their activity in in eastern Canada. You can see it in Montreal. You can see it in the prairies. You can see it most especially in Vancouver proportionately, but very, very active also with Iranian underground money laundering networks in Toronto. And so again, I'll point, uh, I'll point your viewers and listeners to the Cullen Commission records in closing arguments from the federal police point to uh, elite triad uh, international uh, professional money laundering service based in Ontario and Vancouver. So of course this accords perfectly and corroborates perfectly my reporting. And these networks are what's known as the company, the big circle boys, 14K triad, basically the biggest international money laundering services in the world are based when, if we're talking about outside China, they're most strong and Hong Kong, they're, and Macau, they're most strongly based in Toronto and Vancouver for the Western world. Now, you, you've been in trying to educate the Canadian population for a while now, not just in Canada, abroad. Um, but this was explained, I believe, in the late 90s by the Sidewinder report that tried to wave the flag on this and say there's, there's problems here and by and large ignored by, by policymakers. What happened? What, what, how has this gone so astray and, and a blind eye or, or willful blindness? Where is that coming from within the uh, both institutionally, whether it be CSIS, RCMP, municipal, um, CRA? And what about our politicians who should be pressing on this? We've got a, a housing crisis. And if looking at the deaths um, in Vancouver is any indication of the impact of fentanyl, uh, we've got a serious problem on our hands. Yeah, well, to start with Sidewinder, you know, I don't even think that the authors uh, or the people whose reporting it was based upon, who were whistleblowers in Hong Kong in the 1990s on uh, how gangsters were infiltrating Canada's immigration uh, process in, in Hong Kong in the High Commission, no one would say it's a perfect report. It was much maligned and over maligned. And, you know, there may even be, you know, a few assertions that were. Uh, jumped on as overly broad or overly uh, aggressive, 
but this was a draft report. And I think the, the, the fullness of time and the fullness of reasonable examination, reasonable people say this was a, a report that got most of it right. And not only that, it was an innovative report in the world by Canadian intelligence and police that really got this model uh, that is uh, troubling the world right now, correct. You know, back in the late 90s, why was it ignored? There's, uh, you know, there's theories, there's uh, suspects. I think suffice to say that elite capture, uh, pressure back on Canadian intelligence findings was cert bureaucr bureaucratic efforts to bury the report. Absolutely, it's un undeniable that uh, that occurred. Um, you know, why, why can I say that? Look, in the book, I go to David Mulroney, who's probably, uh, a, well, the former ambassador to China, who's one of the top truth speakers in the world right now, because he's set free of government and he can, you know, while still respecting, you know, national secrets acts and things like that, he can speak about how deeply corrupt China's leadership is and how they've captured elites in Canada. So just to give a da data point, I believe now the spread between um, Canadian citizens' view of how our country should engage China versus uh, the leadership, especially with our current government, 87% of Canadians are, are indicating that uh, they have major concerns with our engagement with China and China's activity. And yet we have leaders, uh, including our current ambassador, who are saying China is still on the rise? Let's let's get in uh, while it you know let's get in <laughs> on well well we can still get great deals and pushing pushing a narrative uh, of uh, disproven facts that have been out there with a uh, you know a, a very powerful set in Ottawa Montreal Toronto mostly with a great big note in uh, Vancouver of a business elite that is pushing further engagement and is uh, really suppressing the evidence of corruption. And uh, look, uh, without, without naming names, uh, I can point to from extremely credible sources that have all their information as proven correct. There has been deep corruption of uh, powerful Canadian people all uh, across the country, but I'm gonna point mostly to British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec from both Chinese transnational crime networks and Chinese Communist Party networks. And that has to have some bearing on our just extremely, what, what looks like, to, to put it bluntly, Canada is going in the wrong direction compared to our allies, Australia, especially uh, United States and United Kingdom, who are now in an all out, all government competition with China. And uh, Canada and, and probably New Zealand are, are not on board to the same extent, maybe not at all with that direction. And it presents, a, a, I believe, the great concern of our time. Probably, uh, you know, not to get outside of my frame here, but along with climate change, this is the problem our next generation is facing. Um, membership in the Five Eyes isn't a right. <laughs> it's a privilege. And Canada is going in the wrong direction. It can't be denied on that one. Well, to point it in the other direction, Maybe they have it right. Maybe this strategic ambiguity with with the U.S. faltering and and uh, you know perhaps the party in power right now and and uh, our dear leaders uh, Barton McCallum, um, the Demeray family Falcon, um, and uh, most recently uh, Alan Zeman out of Quebec had an interesting article the other day. You know how are how are they getting it wrong? What's what's so wrong with you know what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, Canadians are, 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 you know, house prices are at all time highs. Everyone's weathered the pandemic relatively well. You, you know, what is so wrong with, with strategic ambiguity, engaging with the Chinese and, and maintaining the Canadian economy in these trying times? Well, the first is a, an, a, a slash economic moral argument. And the second is a straight moral argument. Um, there's the argument that China has actually uh, it is not on the rise economically. They're at or near their apex and becoming more aggressive in the way that any trade that goes to China from the West, as we saw just the other day with a, a Boston Celtics player that spoke out against China, and very quickly the Boston Celtics were expunged from uh, uh, NBA coverage on, on Chinese internet. 
you cannot do business in China uh, at any level without uh, your democracy, your business, uh, your society being leveraged towards uh, doing what China wants you to do. And that's becoming in increasingly apparent. So as a as a quick example, some of those very people that are now, as days after the Michaels were released uh, in, you know, this just, I won't say anything about the case. Everyone knows what happened. There are people saying, what lessons should Canada learn from this? As if what victim blaming at its worst and let's now now that now that this little problem has gone away let's jump more deeply into trade and leverage up uh those people are the same ones that are saying it's wrong of canada to stand canadian politicians to stand up and say there's a genocide or crimes against humanity going on in, in xinjiang so uh, we could go on with examples for days uh, literally but that's just a quick example of how if you want to do business with China, you have to toe their line. One more example, let's look at the Cansino vaccine situation. Uh, most people that are, are, are viewing this tape will know what happened, but Canada got into a deal with the People's Liberation Army linked company, a company that I've reported, its executives were part of uh, the Thousand Talents program, which is a vector of Chinese espionage. And uh, Canada was going to develop a vaccine with the company. And lo and behold, you know, around the time there was a, a rule of law uh, proceeding, which didn't benefit Man Wan Zhao in Vancouver, uh, the, the shipment of, uh, you know, materials that Canada contractually was supposed to have for this vaccine stopped in China. So again, hostage diplomacy style leverage, lives are at stake. You do a deal with China, and uh, if something goes uh, wrong and they want you to just throw the rule of law aside, the deal is done, and you're left in the lurch. Not only that, your citizens counting on a life-saving, potentially life-saving vaccine are now not only at the front of the line, they're out of the line. So that's the moral economic argument. The moral argument is the, who, who, <laughs> how can you argue that you do business with a with with a country that is committing genocide against a minority population in its sort of expansive land hunger really is at the uh, and 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 resource hunger is at the root of that situation. So I I think I could go on, but that's my answer. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a fair answer. Um, you spoke to the privilege of Canada being part of Five Eyes interesting determinations likely to to come by the end of this month, if not next, with regards to Huawei. From your perspective, is Canada a reliable ally? We've seen AUKUS come off and we've seen the Quad come off, Canada not feature at all. Uh, some uh, within the Laurentian uh, policy elite think that's, that's not a big deal. Are our allies looking at us with winced eyes? I think so. Before, uh, you know, we were left out of that important new um, Indo-Pacific deal, which, by the way, is not just about submarines. It's about sharing of the highest level intelligence on, you know, AI and cyber, everything that is essential to this great power, you know, all of government competition with China that that is on now and has been for a while. Canada is left out of that. So for the people trying to sugarcoat that, uh, oh, Canada was never going to be on that, you know, anyway, or it's not an indicator that we're, you know, starting to lose our, our presence with the five eyes. I guess, you know, I'm a little bit new to Ottawa and probably a bit of an outsider, but from my an analysis, it just I don't buy that argument at all. It's going in the wrong direction and it's an extremely bad indicator. And it's a war, it's an alert to the people that are supposedly policy experts and, uh, and leaders in, in Canada that we, uh, I think it's time to start turning that ship because the ship turns very slowly, but it's going in the wrong direction. Bad ally, I don't know. Uh, uh, exposed and weak ally, I would put it this way. Look, again, Canadians, we like to think of ourselves as being well seen in the world and punching above our weight, but let's just compare ourselves to Australia. Australia is doing yo men or yo women's work uh, for for the world right now, they're punching well above their weight. They're getting closer to the uh, the powers that support democracy and human rights. And uh, Canada is is 
just compared to Australia, we're, we're looking like um, an afterthought, uh, a weak country. And I don't think that's the way Canadians uh, want to view themselves, but it, it, it's time for a bit of a wake up call on that one. With all of the issues you, you point to, I'm wondering what's the, you know, what are, what are the top policy recommendations you see? Obviously, d- defense and security is one, but there's also a homeland resilience. What have the Australians done to to protect their democracy, to protect their economy and, and their, their resilience? Well, the big one is, uh, you know, people, knowledgeable people in Washington uh, tell me that Australia is 10 years ahead of its allies in uh, recognizing the CCP threat, uh, the hybrid threat, the economic threat, and taking steady, hard decisions to counter that. And so the big one is, you know, uh, foreign interference laws with teeth that would, uh, you know, force people, uh, business elites, legal elites, political elites, to disclose any hidden interests that that they are doing business or doing the bidding of a uh, of Beijing for for various reasons. And so that came in about two or three years ago in Australia. And as people like Charles Burton will will explain again and again, very quickly, some people that were making a lot of money, some former government figures had to very quickly uh, disclose their interests and cut those deals. I believe similarly in Canada, we would would see Logic tells us some of the people that were very early on um, advocating that Canada push aside the rule of law and and send Ms. Mun back to China, some of those very same people would have very similar deals in the works that aren't disclosed at, at this time. So that that's a big one. And I like to color it with an example. Look, we know, as I've said, uh, elite Canadian politicians have been uh, in the bag, have been corrupted. Look what happened with the case of, I'll just uh, uh, bring it back to casinos. We recently heard about the $800 million Australian casino whale, Juan Zhang Mo. Uh, he's been the subject of amazing reporting in Australia, part of uh, these uh, organized crime junket casino networks that brought in uh, people believed by Austrian, Australian intelligence to be foreign agents. Uh, None other than Xi Jinping's cousin was one of those people uh, flagged. And just to focus on Mr. Huang, an elite United Front Work Department figure, I can draw connections to similar leaders in Vancouver. And the person that uh, allegedly corrupted an Australian senator, you know, through sort of donation activity, this senator started advocating for China's position uh, in the South China Sea. So a very big geopolitical military change of position that would impact the nation and it's tied to donations from a casino whale with connections to uh, China's foreign espionage and of course Mr. Huang lost his Australian citizenship he's over in Hong Kong now uh, you know directly connected to Chinese uh, Communist Party sort of political activity there and all of these activities of exposures happened after Australia started to take a hard line saying, we have clear visibility on these infiltration methods. We are going to institute laws against them. And in fact, you know, the security and the, the, the demo- you know, people that support democracy won the argument against Australia's political, sorry, business elite, which was just similar to Canada, pushing further and further trade and engagement at the expense of these Chinese espionage activities. Now, how, how do you root this out? How, how does this get rooted out in Canada? It gets rooted out by some people going to jail, some people being forced to disclose uh, these hidden interests with foreign governments. So it starts with legal change. Uh, I've, I've uh, talked at length that our Parliamentary uh, Security and Intelligence Committee you know, a high level group of uh, parliamentarians has pointed to Australia as an exemplar who has already instituted these foreign interference laws. And so this is in front of the prime minister's office, these reports, a blueprint of the actions Canada needs to take. Again, Australia and Canada, very similar in constitution and in society. 
it's not a hard one to uh, to be very at the top of Canada's legislative priorities right now to follow Australia's lead. So I could talk on and on at length, but there's your simple answer. The the, the laws are there. Tweak them a little bit uh, if you need to have a few, you know, bring this to the let's restart the Canada-China Relations Committee as it relates to, uh, you know, Canada's position in the five eyes and what needs to happen and get those laws in effect. I did see some of your reporting with regards to uh, Ortis. I'm wondering if you can speak about that. It it seems to come full circle. Right. So um, in the book, I I was able to unpack at length what I learned uh, about Mr. Ortis. And let's just say right off the bat, this case is, uh, I believe, finally scheduled to come to trial uh, early next year. We don't know if Mr. Ortis denies any of the allegations against him, but I I have certainly tried to reach out to him and his lawyer multiple times and never heard back. The allegations are uh, extremely serious. A lot of the information is covered by court publication bans. But what I learned, you know, from from sources that I could report in my book is that uh, it was believed that not it was believed, it was in indictments that Mr. Ortis was selling Canada's uh, operational plans that targeted suspected Hezbollah operatives involved in underground banking in Toronto. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it, he was involved in selling secrets. I reported to encryption technology uh, interests in Vancouver and just as a little aside, it's been mentioned in the Cullen Commission in the federal government's closing how the absolute surge of encryption technology companies in British Columbia is directly related to this, uh, you know, infiltration of the highest level transnational gangs in the world involved in money laundering and, 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 uh, and drug trafficking. Using BC as a hub is directly related to encryption technology companies used by these transnational gangs. So in several cases, it's alleged that Mr. Ortis was selling, that is offering protection, offering secrets to the people that were targeted by the RCMP and the Five Eyes Law Enforcement Group. So in a nutshell, um, at a simple level, the allegations are he sold information to some of the worst criminal interests and uh, money launderers in the world for self-benefit. But as I reported, it's also believed uh, by uh, a number of people in the RCMP that there could have been something more deep and strategic. That is that Mr. Ortis could have been involved in purposely sabotaging Canada's intelligence capacity sabotaging his own unit and and using it to his ends, but also sabotaging it so that Canada's ability to go after uh, sensitive uh, political files, foreign interference, investigations involving uh, actors from Iran, Hezbollah, China could be uh, disabled. And so that points to a, a bigger potential concern. The the beliefs about his activity are that he set back uh, Canada's capacity and intelligence by, you know, if not if not decades, years, and it could be one of the worst intelligence breaches in, in Canada's history, if not the worst. And, and to be clear, Ortis was one of the top intelligence officers in Canada. He was the top RCMP intelligence officer. And uh, so no relationship with CSIS at all. I. Uh, I don't think CSIS was was tainted in any way by uh, his activity, but uh, we know that his former boss wanted to bring the RCMP's intelligence capacity up to the level of uh, of the FBI, and quite the opposite happened through uh, this compromise, which, as I've said, is not denied that I know of, but we'll we'll eventually find out in court uh, some of what happened there. I don't think I think we'll only find out, you know, a minimal details about what really happened there for national security reasons that will be cited in court. Now, it's been a few months since you uh, published Willful Blindness um, and you've been reporting, you're, you're one of the top investigative journalists in Canada, if not North America, on the Chinese Communist Party. How has your reporting and uh, Willful Blindness been received uh, in Canada, um, in, in, in China, and uh, also in the, in the U.S.? 
Well, um, I can say that uh, I already knew that my reporting was catching the eye of the Chinese Communist Party, but I can say definitively that I've been alerted that the Chinese Communist Party is actively interested in the impact of willful blindness, and they're actively interested in my reporting. So that's something. Uh, on the other hand, I also know, and um, since my colleague uh, Calvin Krusty, you know, who was uh, featured in my book for a lot of his uh, activity on the e-pirate file, he and I have been talking to uh, military folks uh, in in Washington. So I know that. Uh, I learned from those conversations and people involved in the all of government competition with China in Washington, D.C. are reading my book and valuing the insights and valuing what I'm saying about uh, this worldwide situation with China and how Canada fits into it. And so all I can say is, uh, at some level, the, the powers of the world are interested in the book. And uh, I guess, you know, uh, I'm, that's, that's rewarding to me. It also is a somewhat, of course, scary that China's interest is increasing, but uh, the reporting has to continue. Beyond picking up uh, willful blindness, uh, what would you say your top book or article recommendations are for people to get up to speed on Chinese Chinese Communist Party, um, asymmetric warfare, hybrid warfare, or their activities within uh, Canada and abroad? First of all, I would recommend The Stealth War by the retired general Rob Spaulding in the United States. It, it really lays out in detail uh, how, how China is, uh, in effect, attacking the rest of the world in, in this Cold War situation. And a new book that just came out called Red Roulette by Desmond Shum. He's a, a, a tycoon that was directly involved in sort of this uh, corruption story or network uh, where he has disclosed that he's blown the whistle on how the Politburo, that is the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party are directly involved in corruption. And uh, this goes to the highest levels. I detail, you know, he touches on with further detail what I uh, get into in the book about a man named Lai Chang Zing. So I point uh, your viewers towards that to find out how high Lai's corruption went. And uh, Mr. Shum uh, has profited, but now, uh, you know, he his family has suffered. His former wife was uh, disappeared and as one of the facilitators of uh, elite high-level corruption involving the Politburo. Okay, Mr. Cooper, thank you very much for your time. Today.